All right, well, welcome everybody. Whether it is your first time joining us or if you've joined us for other events, we are so happy to have you here. I'm Patrick Gallagher with the ELC team. I help produce all of our events, our conference, podcast, and all of the other content that we do. Um, here's the stone cold truth. You have no choice but to be good at remote onboarding. We've experienced a global forced adoption of remote work and this trend will likely persist well beyond these COVIDian times. From a productivity perspective, getting your team up to speed fast is critical for your business, but from a workplace and life happiness perspective and a workplace retention perspective, getting them plugged into your culture and connecting them with people is absolutely essential. But the good news is, is as engineering leaders, we can make a difference here. You're here because you might have asked yourself the scary question of, are my onboarding practices ready to support full-time remote team members at scale? And there might be a quiet voice in your head that might have whispered back, no, I I'm not ready. Well, get ready because you're in the right place. Wumbui Kenya and James Tayek have incredible perspective and experiences to share. Through Andela, Wumbui supports thousands of engineers that are onboarding remotely across 200 top tech companies all the time. So she's seen what works and what doesn't across a ton of different companies. James has been building global teams across time zones for 10 years or for over 10 years. But beyond their own individual experiences supporting onboarding from their different perspectives, they've also worked closely together to support onboarding of new engineers. So James is bringing on new engineers to his team through Andela and Wambui working to support their onboarding with James. So we have a great lens into all of the dynamics that make effective remote onboarding. They're gonna answer questions like, what's the core challenges that you're up against, how you can best prepare, and how to measure your progress and success. So here's how it's going to go. Wumbui and James are going to chat for about 30 minutes. We'll have a few community members join us live. So you'll be able to take what you learn and then expand it through several different case studies in our community. And then we'll have a little bit more of a general Q&A. Um, quick note, we are recording and we will release the recording after the event. Uh, so you'll be able to, to get that. If you have questions you want to be answered, type them in the Q&A window. I'll be monitoring both the chat and the Q&A. Um, and so with that, that's where if you'd like to um, submit Q&A, that's how you do it. And finally, make sure you take notes if you have any new ideas or actions you want to take, because at the end, we're going to crowdsource ideas from everybody here. And I'll ask you to share one action that you're taking to improve your onboarding. So make sure you note down an idea that you're inspired with. So with that, it is time for me to introduce you to our speakers. Wumbui Kenya is VP of Partner Engineering at Indela, an engineering as a service business that helps companies build remote teams quickly and cost effectively. Indela has over a thousand software engineers working as full time embedded members of development teams at over 200 leading tech companies. Wumbui was formerly Group Managing Director at pa or Group Managing Director Pan Africa and South America for the global technology consulting firm ThoughtWorks. She brings extensive global experience working in the professional services industry. She's currently based in Nairobi and has worked in North America, Europe, and Africa. Um, so welcome, Wumbui. Thank you, Patrick. Absolutely. Uh, James Tayek has built and led distributed diverse teams of engineers across locations and time zones for over 10 years. Currently, he leads the growth acquisition team at Coursera. Previously, he led the growth and integrations engineering teams at PagerDuty. He's passionate about people, technology, and learning. He believes strongly in the value of diversity and championing a sense of belonging for everybody from day one. He's well-versed in growth strategy, chaos engineering, major incident response, and blameless practice in creating cultures grounded in trust and psychological safety. Wumbui and James, welcome. We are so happy to have you here. Take it away. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that great introduction, Patrick. And Good morning, everyone, or should I say good evening or good night, depending on where you are. We're very much distributed on this call. We've got people in, I heard, Belarus, Kenya, Chicago, and the Bay Area, of course, as well. So uh, it's great to be here with you, Wambui, and I can't wait to share some of our experiences and the lessons that we've learned. Um, this is something I'm really passionate about, making remote teams work really well. And, you know, I'm really excited to hear some stories and thoughts and questions from those of you here on Zoom as well, so we can have some great conversations. And uh, Wambui, nice to see you. How, how are you? Are you ready for this? 
I'm ready, James, and thank you. It's a pleasure to be here as well and to continue the conversation that I know we both feel quite passionately about. Um, and certainly, mm. hopefully, to also learn from others around sort of things that they've tried and tested, especially now that we're being forced to being remote. Um, so looking forward to it. Great. So let's just set the scene a bit. So, you know, before before we get into how we can how we can improve onboarding now we're remote, what are some of the changes and challenges that you've seen, especially recently, Wambui, with the dramatic changes in these COVIDian times? Sure, that's a great question. Um, for many people, being um, forced to be remote is very new. <laughs> so you're probably feeling like you've been caught unaware as you think about bringing on new team members. I know for Antala, one of the things that we had to solve for was how to issue company laptops to new employees in seven countries with limited movement due to the pandemic. Um, that definitely took some creativity. Um, but it's also in how we shift how we think about sessions or activities, like the lunches or the coffees, we sort of get to know each other moments that drive team bonding or enculturation. Um, in some organizations, it's been finding how to make it easier to find people and documents. I've heard stories of um, companies where they're like, there is no company directory because there's no one to pick up the phone. And so how do you think about sort of when you have to send a new employee to, um, to go find where IT sits, uh, where does IT sit, especially if it's like in a large Slack organization. So for some customers, we've certainly heard a lot of pain and just feeling unstructured and unprepared in managing change, um, especially when the people who need to run remote onboarding are themselves adjusting to being remote. Um, so certainly I think it's ran the gamut. I think certainly for Andala, we've had six years of learning what it means to be remote and distributed because that's how we embed our team members. But I'm curious, James, how, ha James, how, how have your teams adjusted? How, how are they doing remote? Well, I think, I think we're finding it much harder. You know, I'm hearing this from many people, my fellow managers, as well as engineers. And I think the term that comes to mind a lot for me is out of sight, out of mind. And this is what we really need to combat. You know, it's very easy to, for new people especially, to forget that these new people are there. There's no visual prompts mm. in the office that you usually get. Um, I've worked with remote teams in different locations for many years, but in the past, in local offices. And now everyone's remote in every office. Everyone's working for, apart from each other. And only a few months ago, my team here in California was in the office. And, you know, just to echo what you said, Wambui, relationship building for new folk happened at lunch, happy hours between meetings mm -hmm. or just, just in the team room. And these serendipitous encounters where people meet each other, they're much less likely to happen. And this affects new people disproportionately, I think. So that's why the onboarding is key. And, you know, we want people to be able to ask questions, to be able to gain confidence quickly. And for managers, we don't get that body language either. The signals that we get when we're face to face with people or just observing the team in the office, they're just not there, which makes it difficult to spot and detect problems early and mitigate them. So I think the good news here is that there are ways to get ahead of all these problems and great onboarding, remote onboarding is key to this. No, I like it. And, you, and you're very right that certainly there are ways to great onboarding. Um, and I know one key ingredient is preparation. <laughs> and I mm. think when you think about onboarding, there's everything that happens before and then there's during onboarding and then certainly how you set the team up for success for after onboarding. What do you do to just prepare the team for onboarding or to prepare to bring on new team members? Well, you know, I, I start off by saying that it's more important now than ever to prepare well, you know, before mm -hmm. someone joins. If you think about a time when you were new at a company, you know, I know, I know for me, I've, I'm sure we've all got good and bad memories, but I remember being a new engineer in London when I, I was junior and no one was expecting me. There was no desk. There's no one to greet me. You know, I felt lonely, isolated. And, you know, that that was that happened for some time, this organization. Um, and that was on site, right? So imagine what it's like if someone's new sitting at home and they don't have a great experience when they join. So, you know, I've had a lot of very good experiences as well. But, you know, for me, the key thing is a nurturing environment for new people, building trust and psychological safety early, helping the new person feel welcome, 
before they even arrive on day one and at ease with their new team members. And, you know, doing that then leads to people being able to easily ask questions, to gain confidence, to be productive and make that impact um, that we're looking for much faster. So I think, I think there's the three main elements of the manager, the, the onboarding buddy and the team themselves. So for the manager, I think don't leave everything to HR. You know, the equipment, the joining info, all of these things. Sometimes, you know, HR have a lot of lots of things to do. I think as a manager, I think it's our responsibility to check in, make sure everything's happening, um, and make sure that people have got what they need to get going on day one and and feel welcome. Um, sending out welcome box is great. You know, I think a lot a lot of teams are doing that, but I think it's important to remember that that shouldn't replace regular contact prior to day one. Make it really easy for the new joiner to ask anything that's on their mind. And, you know, I, I want to make sure I've got time on my calendar as soon as possible when they join so I can give that personal welcome as well. Um, when it comes to the buddy, make sure they're ready. Talk to them. Um, prepare together the, on, the onboarding checklist. I think that's very important, having that checklist ready and talking through and making sure that you've thought intentionally about what is a good thing for that person to be working on when they join. And then, you know, I think above all the team, right? You know, I think that the, the team culture needs to be very much about um, understanding that it's important that they introduce themselves to the person, that they welcome them, they introduce themselves. I, I emphasize that so much because I think often the onus is on the new person. Oh, introduce yourself. But I think we need to switch that around and say, okay, it's up to us. We're already comfortable in the environment. Make sure we're doing those intros, especially being remote. And emphasize, emphasize empathy with the team. You know, help everyone understand that it's not easy right now, but it's especially difficult and tough for someone who's new. And set that expectation to check in and reach out, ask the new person questions and um, do the, exercise that curiosity that we're also expecting the new person to be exercising so those are some thoughts from me um over to Wambui how, what, sure. what do you have what's your feeling about day one preparation yeah and and I love how you brought back sort of um, memories of my, my first day at a Boston company um as a software engineer um in a team that was um at a full capacity in the office space and I was sort of shown to my one my desk, which was one of four in a printer room. So I just sort of had like random people coming in to, to pick up their pieces of paper. Um, and at my desk was a big binder that was introducing me to onboarding for account managers <laughs> and feeling very, very lost on that first day. So it brings back memories. I think you raise really good points. And I think what I really enjoy about sort of even our teams that get to onboard on, 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 on with your team, James, is sort of this, there's a lot of intention and investment in what it looks like to be successful. And I think one of the things that you also really do beforehand is getting your teams ready for the incoming person. I think oftentimes onboarding is thought of as something that is in preparation for the new person um, and things that they need to do and not sort of what, what, what ultimately has to be sort of the mental preparation and awareness and buy-in of the process for the teams that are receiving um, the, the, the new team member. I think one thing that I would, because I don't know sort of for everyone that's on the call, oftentimes what Andela will recommend is ensure you have a champion. And I think, James, you describe yourself very much as what we mm. call a champion, someone that can set the tone and the expectations up front, um, but also ensures that if you are onboarding um, multiple team members across different teams, there's consistency in how those team leads or the engineering managers are thinking about what success looks like. So that's really, really important. So that, that notion of a, a champion, and it has to be someone that feels empowered and responsive. So when things aren't working or things need to get tweaked, they're able to sort of help architect and, um, and, and, and help to sort of make some of those changes. Thanks, Wambu. Yeah, I think that, you know, those words empowered and responsive for the champion, I think that, you know, that sounds key, that that, mm -hmm. that champion is able to, you know, they have permission to be able to um, speak up if something's not working. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Thank you. So we've talked about the preparation for onboarding. Mm -hmm. Now let's move on to when the new person or people arrive. Yeah. More specifically, you know, how do you make their first week successful? Sure, sure. 
Um, I think you touched on it, sort of this like this notion of the welcoming, the welcoming rituals. Um, and now that it's remote, <clears throat> I think it's really thinking about the messages you're sending out to the team that sort of really create the enthusiasm and the motivation around having the team person come on, what team are they working on, even stating things like who's their buddy, so just so sort of other people on the team sort of know who to check in with. Um, but then, but then also adding them to, in the context of remote to all the Slack channels. So not just to the one that is for the team that is onboarding them, but certainly to all the Slack channels. So they have a better sense of where else they can go play and get a better sense of the vibe. Right. Um, and then really setting up time and pre-setting those meetings with critical team members. Um, so that the face and the name and the context begins to settle for, um, the, the new team members. Um, oftentimes we, we think about sort of what are week one objectives um, and for many companies this is sort of set up in a playbook or some sort of a guide. I highly recommend creating greater structure around how you think about these week one objectives. Um, some of the guidance we often give our teams is think about it in the construct of what are the meetings that must take place. There's the one-on-one -on -one with the manager, there's the, the meeting that sometimes is led by HR, but certainly it's important that the engineering leader is also involved around setting up sort of what are the company's missions, what, what, what are some of the strategies, why are we doing the things that we're doing that have caused these new team members to join the team. And then for an engineering teams, what is the mandate of engineering? Sort of what, what are your expectations around um, the things that the team is, has gravitated towards around quality and around feedback and around communication. And then very specifically, what are some of the KPIs that are important to the team? Then the other is make sure you invite them to the team times, whether it's the fun ones, but also the stand-ups. And then ensure that they are able to meet and make time with their buddy in a way that sort of allows them to um, get to know each other a bit better. Um, and then shadowing. So what are the paired sessions that make sense in week one? Um, and how are you establishing what some, some sort of easy tasks that can be accomplished in week one, just to sort of get them going and ensure that they have access to all the relevant systems. And then allocating time for self time, sort of how do you, because there's going to be a lot of bombarding of documents, how are you organizing the documents? And then how are you structuring it in terms of what is the map that they should be using in terms of what's most important up front? And then what are some of the things that are maybe nice to be able to, to access and to read and, 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 and ramp, but, but, but then also what's most critical. Things that we think about in terms of week one and how things are structured, it's really around sort of documentation. So not just code base, but certainly process, um, the architecture, um, the tools that are used, because sometimes it's like, well, why didn't you use that particular tool? Well, I didn't know it existed or it was something that we use. So just listing them so that they know what to ask and what to test in terms of their access. A really critical one is communication. So when you're not in the same office or sort of in the same hallways with someone that is being brought on, it's hard to sort of ha have people pass by and say hi. <laughs> um, it's hard to get a better sense of how are they feeling, um, sort of just from, from facial expressions or physical um, expression. Um, and then there's no water cooler talk, right? And so how are you being mindful about trying to create those serendipitous moments that you spoke about earlier um, happening in your communication channels? That's really, really important. The last one I would, I would stress is sort of how are you communicating and ensuring that they are well aware of their team best practices? Make sure you're making those things clear in week one. Um, so it's sort of what are the norms and expectations of the team um, and, and sort of and how do those show up um, on a day to day basis? I think those are sort of the, the critical things to think about in terms of week one objectives. It feels really packed. I know you're not keen on schedules, but, but, but one thing for you to sort of add on in terms of other things you think about on week one. Thanks. Yeah, I think you, you covered a lot there. That was fantastic, Wambui. I think the, all of those things are so important to have that structure for the new person. Um, I, think, I think the thing I just add to that is, you know, don't overwhelm people too much on, on week one. Um, mm. Joining remote is really hard. And I, I mentioned the company, you know, a few years ago when I was junior. I, I remember the, the senior engineers were really heads down and unapproachable. And I think that during week one, letting people know that it's okay for them to slow down if it means helping that new person mm -hmm. um, and 
being open to answer questions is, is, is really important. Um, I make sure that I always have a one-on-one -on -one as soon as possible, I mentioned that. And mm -hmm. what, part of the purpose of my first, you know, I want to get to know, know that person and I've probably, you know, I've met them through the uh, interviewing process and um, all, of, all of that, that process there. I think really getting to know the person, asking them some questions uh, about about themselves, and giving them, making them feel comfortable, uh, building that trust is really important. And a, a big element is giving them permission. Right. I think the part of the challenge of joining a new company is you don't know the norms, you don't know the expectations, and mm -hmm. people are nervous about asking questions or being, you know we don't want that we want people to be confident and ask questions um so something someone said to me a few years ago that really stuck with me on day one was there are no silly questions the only questions that are silly are the ones you don't ask and that mm. is the i always use that line because i feel as though giving people that permission to be curious and realize that if you're stuck with an acronym or a term there's probably five other people around that may be were, didn't ask about it and other people are going to learn from that new person so i really emphasize that that you know permission um also i give permission to post messages to be social post ideas thoughts questions observations react to things um in public channels in preference to using private channels because i think that it's a really good way to to uh, for people to build confidence when they know it's safe to be able to ask questions and and have that culture that you know people are joining in and having a bit of fun fun with that if a new person is is really cool um people get to know people faster uh and also you know contribute team ideas during team sessions i say that as well be bold be adventurous get on slack and zoom calls regularly with others pair up to solve a problem using a screen share you know, i think being really explicit about those things on day one is gives that person that freedom to be able to be themselves as well, which is what we want people to be doing when they join us. Um, and what else? So yeah, I think a b setting a big emphasis on getting to know the rest of the team and even people beyond the team as well. Mm -hmm. um, having giving giving people guidance on who they they should get to know on the onboarding plan, who they can who they should have a coffee chat with on, on zoom now and the other thing i'd say is something simple a quick a task that's a quick win is is really important um having a goal around week one to with an achievable win gives a sense of accomplishment and builds confidence so those are some of the things that i'd add to uh Wambui's points there that's awesome so no so now that we've set up week one to be fantastic <laughs> and to be highly productive. How do you think about, um, I know you and I've had many discussions about this, really around, and I think for, for the context of those that are on the call, um, hmm. oftentimes, and I think for the onboarding that we're referring to sort of, you're trying to embed them into your team, right? So this is not really for yeah. short-term engagement. So certainly in the Q&A, we can think about how that differs. But team integration and ownership of the individual in terms of processes and communication is really important. Mm. How do you think about sort of this next phase of onboarding around how the team, how the new team members are integrating and fitting into your larger team? Well, I, th I think what you were describing earlier, Wembley, was really helpful. So, you know, the new person easily learning the, about the company, the team, how they operate, and how they can contribute quickly. I think they're key. And the prerequisite for that is to me making the information super easy to discover and well organized and simple. You know, I, I try to make sure we've got a one pager that describes the team's, um, you know, what, what the team's remit is, uh, our vision, and what the areas are that we own. So that it's, you know, it's very difficult if things are scattered all over the place. And this can happen with Google Docs. You know, the Google Docs, if they're not indexed well, they may not even be in a place where everyone can see them. So I think being intentional about that is really important for remote onboarding when people can't just go and ask people a question easily. And this is a great discipline to have anyway. You know, I think as a team, it's really important to be organized with information um, and also foster that team culture of writing things down in an organized way rather than indirect messages. And if you do this, then for new people that 
path to success is as is uh, accelerated i think because there isn't so much digging to find things we have an onboarding boot camp which has now gone online we used to do it in person and we use our own platform at coursera to actually run our own onboarding boot camp and we also make sure that we've got a very clear path to ownership so I think, you know, we talk about a 30, 60, 90 day plan, um, setting clear expectations at these milestones and checking in regularly on them is key. Um, and you know, I think that, that that ownership should include on call responsibility. You know, I, I think that being on call is one of the fastest way to learn about the team. And, you know, I, I think I've read somewhere that you know, being on call for a week or, you know, especially if you have some incident that you're having to uh, manage then it's it can be faster ramp up than anything so um but obviously making sure there's a support network and other start with shadowing make sure that you're building confidence and are able to ask questions but that that person can have that path to ownership quickly um the context the why i think that's another thing that's really key uh, making sure that people really understand why things are important um not just being given tasks i think that as early as possible that that's important but obviously at the beginning a bit more guidance and directions needed um but as people gain confidence i don't think it's i think it's good not to hold back in giving ownership so that people mm -hmm. can feel empowered and they they gain that confidence um it's a bit uncomfortable at first when you've given ownership of new things but i think the the team needs to realize that it's important to give things away that they know for the good for the goodness of the scaling the team um, and you know i think just one really important point i'd say you know we we talk about culture fit and i think that it's a from an inclusiveness point of view it's really important to think of anyone who's new as a culture ad not a culture fit you know and i think this goes against some of the thinking that we have but i like that um if you remember, you know, the, remember that someone can bring so much to your culture and add to it. And a healthy culture is one that adapts and improves over time. And it and that happens through adding people to your team with different perspectives from different backgrounds. And embracing new ideas and differences is something that is needed. So, you know, culture fit can be a bit of an anti-pattern, I think, sometimes in that respect. And also remember that new people are offering incredible insights you know if we think about uh, coursera we're offering education worldwide mm -hmm. and we have remote team members now we have a few people over in africa who are who have a different perspective on learning in a different parts of the world and i think that if we're not careful uh, and deliberate about letting new people be part of the ideation process as part of the brainstorming process and really listening to new people we're going to miss out on a ton of opportunities so i think as part of the onboarding remote onboarding i think setting that that um, intention that new people are there to actually add not just receive information and fit in i think that's mm. key um creating the spaces for interactions you know i think i think this is another thing that is really key having online social events i mentioned earlier you know we're not doing happy hours in person we're not doing team lunch but having intentional uh, um, sessions where people can maybe have it show pictures of where they live or some activities they've, they've been doing or something new that they've learned since they've gone remote you know these these have been exercises we've done and we found that people really get to know each other really well and bond well when they understand a bit more about that person and their their day-to-day -day life and mm -hmm. they don't just see them through this mm -hmm. zoom window um so and just one last thing i'd add is zoom drop-ins we were using video at the moment but i think that there's a you know traditionally i think for remote there's been a lot of emphasis on turning the video camera on and what i found is that people aren't don't always want the video camera on and mm -hmm. it's okay now and again to have a drop-in session where it's audio only people can do uh, talk about the code base or about some new ideas they've got without without the video and there's not so much pressure then for people to be you know on on the video and you know that's another thing i'd add but video obviously important you can get a lot more um 
you get a lot more from video than you do from audio usually. So, but I think making that an option is great. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I, and, and I hadn't really considered that. I think we get really strict about video always on, but I think creating mm. that balance is really important, especially now that we're all remote. <laughs> um, and, sort of, yeah. and, and I like it that like you're sort of involved, but not necessarily on, on. So that's really great. And I think yeah. a lot of what you've stressed there is a sort of, I think one of the things that we really try and push, especially since our teams are remote and distributed, is this notion that communication actually becomes the really one of the most important indicators that integration is happening. And I think you've given really good practical examples of, of, of how else to ensure that that is happening. Um, but it's ensuring how are team members participating? Um, are, they, are the new members speaking up? Are they taking ownership? I think these are really great examples. Um, and I think for those of you that are onboarding champions, when you start to see that the teams are communicating directly, as opposed through you or through the um, the team leads, then you have a great sense mm -hmm. that integration is actually happening through the good times and the bad times. So that's really good. That's great. Yeah, that's awesome. So we've covered the preparation and mm -hmm. how new team members build confidence. And, you know, we think they're doing well, but how do we know they're doing well? What kind of feedback loops do you put in place, Wambui? Sure, and I know we're running out of time, so I'll try and be brief in this one. Mm. But I think it's really important. So for 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 Andela, a, a lot of what's really important is this notion of trust and empowerment for the collective team, because it's less about sort of trust and empowerment of, of the individual. But how have you formed and normed as this one team? And the way that we measure um, empowerment is it's in the integration. And I think you gave really good examples. So sort of, I call it like the, how are the teams dancing together <laughs> and, actively, and actively giving each other feedback. But, but we have to, I mean, team dynamics is a critical ingredient, but the other is productivity. And so for many of our customers, certainly they want to have advanced conversations about their expectations on things like, when will my team be productive? When, when, when will this um, when will we be able to see sort of really quality deliverables? Um, and so it's, it might be the notion of um, first submission of code and some quality expectations. So it's important that these things are clear up front um, and that you have enough checkpoints to establish that things are going well and to be able to iterate and support um, for success. Um, I think for remote onboarding, one of the things that I always make sure that we, that we really emphasize is some teams will think about it in the context of 30, 60, 90 days. However, it is you and your team think that the sort of the path to being fully productive and fully integrated, whatever that timeline is, don't stop. Like keep the checkpoints going because oftentimes teams will think, ah, oh, we, we got through our first sprint or we sort of got through our first release. But I actually really stress, keep going with it until the first failure. How are the teams supporting each other? How are they coping together? How are they sort of ensuring that they're having really productive retros and thinking about things um, in terms of future and ways of improving? And to what extent are your team, new team members as much participating in those conversations? So don't stop just because the timeline stopped and keep going and ensuring that the team dynamics continue to persist well beyond onboarding. So those, those are some of the things that I think we would um, push as best practices in terms of ensuring things are going well. How about you? Well, yeah, thank you, Wembo. I think it's great points there. I think the being able to measure the success and set those expectations is, is really important. I think you spoke mm -hmm. to that. Um, you know, we I, I try to make sure that we we share the expectations for the engineering level that there, you know, we call it the rubric. Walk through that with examples and have back and forth conversation to ensure that people are really understanding expectations. Because you know, I, think, I think you can publish all sorts of documentation and things, but unless someone really, unless someone, you, someone plays that back in their own language, you don't really know whether they've got it. So I think, I think that that is really key, that mm -hmm. the expectations are shared and people know, okay, I'm a senior engineer, um, I'm expected to, you know, have uh, to demonstrate leadership skills and lead a project and um, have be, help other more junior engineers be successful. Um, so those are some examples there. Um, I think the other thing is setting some simple OKRs early. You know, we, we use the OKR framework and having the new engineers as part of their plan 
incorporate OKR so they understand how that works as well. And uh, I think that I think that's really helpful. One on ones critically important, even more so being remote. I think you know to have regular check ins. Um, ask I try to ask coaching questions and listen as much mm-hmm. as possible to find out how people are feeling and also acknowledge some of the things that are happening at the moment. You know, I think I think that we can't just think it's business as usual. People are really struggling in many cases. There's a lot going on at home and one-on-ones are a great opportunity to build that trust so that people can share when they maybe need a bit more help, when they need, you know, that the things are going on that are distracting them. And I think finding out about that early is really helpful so that you can provide the help they need. Um, and, you know, just to echo what, what we said, you know, I've, I've been there as well. You know, the checklists, you look at the onboarding checklist and it's like, oh, week one, week two is filled out. And, oh, that was great. But what about then it gets the rest late. of it? And, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, I mean, and it's, it's interesting, the question at the beginning, on what is onboarding? You know, I, I feel as though I'm still, you know, it's an ongoing process onboarding. But I think we're mm-hmm. talking mainly about that first, you know, uh, three to six months time range. Um, but, mm-hmm. you know, people are transitioning into new roles a lot and you know it's a constant constant check-in making sure that those one-on-ones are high quality and not just oh you know where's the project it has to be very intentional about um the actual situation that we're in at the moment and how to help that person be uh be as productive and happy as Mm -hmm. possible in in Mm -hmm. the role management by walking around is something that you know i think traditionally people have talked about that you know you you can walk around and be present and um, ask questions and let uh, be approachable that's not so easy when you're remote and you know i think that that's where sharing to open slack channels and having forums where people can observe you know as a manager i'm not looking to um you know poke my nose in everything that's going on but i'd like to get a sense of people communicating with each other and reacting to things. And, you know, I think having open Slack mm-hmm. channels is, is a healthy way in the same way as we have an open door policy and an open office. Right? So um, be available and supportive, I think, is another thing. You know, office hours is really helpful, drop-in sessions. Um, and, you know, I think, I think that the other thing that I found really helpful for getting feedback is I've created a Slack channel for new people who've joined to learn from each other and for us to kind of, for me to be able to ask, how are you getting on? Where are the problems? And Mm -hmm. I've, it's been really, really interesting what's come up there. People have um, shared, you know, they, oh, they'd like to do more pairing. There's not enough, Um, you know, it's, they've they've expressed how challenging it can be, it can be to work across teams. Mm -hmm. And I think that these safe spaces where you can get that feedback quickly um, and be able to, act on it is really key and as well as the safe space an anonymous feedback mechanism is helpful so mm-hmm. we've at Coursera we've done an engagement survey specifically for remote uh, onboarding mm-hmm. and the remote experience and that's been really insightful you know we've learned a lot from that and it's helping us know where we have to focus our effort to to improve so those engagement surveys are key that's awesome. And I think, I mean, it sort of really emphasizes this notion of culture ad. And I don't know that people mm. often think of the new people <laughs> sort of being able to actually influence um, even as they are onboarding. Um, I know we're getting ready to get um, engage um, some of our other participants. Um, and so if we had to conclude, James, what would you say is the most is most critical for remote onboarding, sort of summarizing a lot of what we've shared so far. Mm. What, what, what for you is the, the summary? I think for me is a really supportive, welcoming team that makes an effort to slow down a bit and help a new person mm-hmm. and hasn't forgotten what it's like being you. Mm-hmm. And that then leads to the psychological safety and trust that helps the new person gain confidence, step up and own, apply leadership skills and also and you know ultimately make that impact that um, everyone wants to make when they join a new organization that's great and i think i've certainly a lot of really awesome tips um to think about in truly creating the success of the of the full team i think if i was to to, to share things that we i tend to emphasize especially when i think about um oftentimes andela's onboarding several engineers across multiple teams 
it's really that I, I mentioned this earlier, the champion, having someone that is empowered and responsive and able to set the tone for what successful onboarding looks like and really takes into consideration the feedback that's coming from the incoming lot, but also from the existing team. Um, and then really setting the tone for what it means to be all remote. Because for some of you, you may be going back to offices. And so I, I stress, keep some of the, the things that you have learned about being all remote um, and things that reduce some of that friction. But having a champion that sort of really sets that as an expectation is really critical for how you have to do it um, at scale with larger teams or across multiple teams. And anyway, as always, James, love having yeah, the conversation with you. I think we'll, we'll pass it back to Patrick and, and um, engage with the rest of the audience. Wombui, James, that was absolutely incredible. Thank you both so much for, for helping dive deep into to everything with onboarding. I'm sitting here and the, the lines of new people are culture ads, not culture fits. And communication is an indicator, an indicator of integration. Those are just lines that are ringing in my ears of really great concepts to think about what my role can be in with, with remote onboarding. So thank you. Um, we're going to be jumping into our live participant session. So we have a, a few members joining us who are going to be sharing specific challenges that they're dealing with so that for all of you who are tuning in, you'll be able to understand how to apply some of these insights from Wambui and James across different contexts. So this will help you multiply your experience in being able to improve your onboarding. Um, so we're gonna have time for Q&A after. So as we're talking, share your questions in the Q&A. We've had a couple really great ones come through the chat. Um, so keep sharing your questions and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, so with that, um, Chris, would you like to jump in and share your question and challenge? Sure, thanks. Thanks for uh, having me on. Um, one of the you know, main topics that we've talked about here is culture. And um, if 2020 has been anything, it's been change. And that probably is the biggest change is probably in culture. And so what I'm most curious about is when we're onboarding, you know, new team members, um, especially at, at our company, we, we put a great emphasis on culture. Um, in, in the interview process, you know, again, that, 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 that culture, quote unquote, fit thing, um, you know, is, is a large part of the decision making. Um, now we're remote, uh, culture is vastly different. Um, we don't really even know what our culture is. You know, it, it's a c continuously evolving thing. And so, well, we had it defined that before we don't have defined now. And so, um, you know, our existing, our existing team members went through that change with us. And so now that we're kind of on the other side of that, um, what are some of the, the good tools and, and, and techniques for imparting that, that, that new culture, the quote, the quote new normal onto uh, these new team members when we're still trying to figure out ourselves? Mm. Shall I have a go at this one? I, I think I sure. think that what you're describing, Chris, is something that you need to embrace. And you know, I, quite often, I, what I've seen when people have gone through working on culture and the identity is getting together with the team and having brainstorming sessions and discussing together with everyone what what that culture should be and what it should look like. Um, when you've gone through this shift, I think it's stepping back and actually looking at what worked before what and what works now and having that open dialogue about it um, so that everyone feels part of that shift that you're talking about. Um, you know, I, if, if you just carry on, if you're aware that things aren't working anymore and just keep going, then I think that you probably miss out on, on an opportunity that you have right now to get back to a place where you can help discuss this and, and define something that will be successful for you in the future. And I think if I could add, and I don't know, Chris, if you have mm. more questions um, tied to it. One of the things in terms of evolving culture, um, certainly for Andela, we get tested with scaling culture <laughs> because the numbers of people is, um, is forever um, changing, is sort of having the conversation or the touch points to think about because oftentimes culture is about like the things you reward and recognize and sort of mm. where you have guardrails around sort of behaviors that are unacceptable. But what does that look like for an all remote team and having that a very open sort of ongoing dialogue? And it's also a little bit of investment on the, on the team's part in terms of how do we create it? Is it the iconography? Is it new emoticons that are used in Slack? But how are you creating 
those new moments of celebration in a way that might feel um, maybe a, a, a little different than all going out for a drink, <laughs> but, but you still are sort of creating those moments and then creating those fun moments, which might feel a little bit unnatural to start off with, um, but eventually the team starts to, you know, enjoy the trivia or whatever it is that sort of creates those fun moments remotely. Mm. Does that help, Chris? Yeah, that, that, that um, you know, kind of really does a good job of, of summarizing what we've, what we've gone through. Um, you know, I know we talked a lot about docu documentation and, you know, throwing documents at, at, at uh, new people and all that kind of stuff. And this is kind of where there's really never good documents, right? You don't, you don't really have a culture document very often, and it's probably not very up to date. Um, and so probably the hardest thing that I have to deal with is, um, you know, defining it and then measuring it, you know, again, how, how well is the new person getting, you know, the, the, the culture and I, like you said, adding to it and, uh, you know, how, you know, as, as leaders, you know, that's pro to, to me, especially, that's probably one of the most important um, metrics that, that we mm -hmm. have um, and probably one of the hardest ones to actually gauge. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that combination of, you know, ultimately other team delivering, but before that, what kind of feedback can you gather from people in different ways? You know, I, I mentioned a few different ways to, to build the trust that allows you to get the feedback from people. But I think when it comes to culture, uh, there's a certain amount of trial and error with trying different exercises, trying different activities and being very, um, you know, very good at identifying when something just isn't working, isn't landing and, usually having that it's kind of uncomfortable to have a feedback look loop on even on meetings and town halls and things like that but i think that the more intentional you are about about you know what did how did that go how did that meeting go what did you hear you know that's something that, that someone said to me once you know i always ask people what did you hear because then you'll get a sense of what actually landed and whether the message that that uh whether that's culture or process or whatever whether it really is resonating with people and that's it's the resonance that, that you really need i think to be able to uh, be convincing and, and land your your message and i think resonance if you're looking for ways to measure it chris is, is really looking at engagement and where is engagement happening and what sort of sparks engagement versus sort of um, reduces engagement mm -hmm. and then if, if you're finding that there's low engagement then clearly there's a, the limited either trust or connection and that's when I'd, I'd sort of use what james was talking about in terms of like anonymous surveys to get a better sense of what's what's broken um and then what needs to get tweaked uh, well, I, th I thank you both for your insight it's been uh, uh eye-opening to say the least just in a short amount of time here awesome thank you thank you chris for for great questions um so we're gonna jump in jump in and invite megan up um the the last one unrequited this is not my place but my favorite definition of culture is culture is a byproduct of behavior and language so if you're looking for inputs i think the first place you can look is what are the conversations that people are choosing to talk about and then behavior can be the whole tree of actions mm -hmm incentives and everything um so i'll put my foot back in my mouth and I like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good um megan jump on in and share your question sure um so i was curious what i guess in your opinion what would be the best way to provide resources i'm going to be onboarding my first engineer remotely in the next couple of weeks and uh prior to us all going to remote when we had a new engineer we would you know be around a whiteboard talking about architecture kind of coaching them through their first PR by just sitting right next to them. And so a lot of these things can live, um, you know, in docs, they can be self-serving, but at the same time, if you have someone coaching there, you can also build that team relationship. So how do you kind of see the balance between those two avenues? Um, I can tackle this one. So I think one of the, there's these, there are awesome tools that exist out there. So I would still say use the whiteboard, but maybe it's going to be on, I never pronounce it, right? I don't know if it's Miro or Miro or Envision, but there's sort of tools that exist out there that allow you to still sort of be able to, to, to do your drawings. It might not be as great as if you were holding a marker, but either way, <laughs> things get communicated. 
because it is hard to sort of just look at a ton of documents and sort of go through a bunch of Google Docs and being able to make that interactive is so, so important because then it also allows for those moments of, you know, sort of getting to know each other and getting to understand communication styles, for example. So I would say don't um, just find the new channel to do those things, but still do them. Um, and then if you are going to do documentation, just always making sure that you have the framing, right? Like why, what are the things that, what, what am I going to be looking at that helps me answer certain questions? So just so that it, be, it becomes a little bit easier to navigate. Um, but yeah, but to the extent you can still do it. And then with paired programming, one of the things that, um, cause I'm a, I'm a big proponent of paired programming is just remembering the exhaustion of having to do it online. Um, cause it's a little bit different when you sort of are sitting physically next to each other and I can just be like, I need a bio break. I'm going, but then it's sort of this, the, the burden of, oh, we're both on. So we should really be on. <laughs> and I liked James's, um, one about audio. Cause maybe there could be paired programming where we have a shared screen but don't have to be necessarily on and I can still be in my PJs or we're having a productive conversation. So I think it's also just being mindful of um, make, taking the breaks and creating those fun moments because sometimes with remote we forget we are also supposed to be getting to know each other and how are you sort of helping the teams to think about creating a bit more of a balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great, Mambu. I think one thing I'd add is, you know, I mentioned that we get, we've been getting feedback from people in the channel and, one of the things that came up was a recognition that everyone learns differently. And I think that the important element, you know, is ask the new person how they'd like to learn. Talk talk about their learning style. Ask that, you know, some people actually prefer time alone to read through things. Other people like a lot more interactive. I know, I know I'm more of an extrovert and I'm, I love getting up and whiteboarding and talking aloud while I'm thinking. But I think that if you do that, then you'll be able to tailor it to that person's learning style and they'll be able to onboard more quickly. Um, so yeah, that's just a piece of advice I give. Great, thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Megan. Uh, next up we have Shilpa. Shilpa, jump in, share your challenge and share your question. Sure. Uh, so I'm going to be entering into this unique place in a week from now. I'm going to be joining a new company as an engineering manager, and I will be onboarding two to three new hires there. So the people have already been interviewed and selected, and uh, I've been that role where I'll be trying to understand you know, how the team works, how the company works, as well as support uh, a team of eight to 10. So what would be like the top two or three things I should watch out for or focus on any, any specific advice for this situation? Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is make sure that you're getting help, you know, I think from the organization, I talk to your manager and ask for their advice and, and make sure that you get the space to be able to understand before you're having to teach other people if possible. Um, it, it does sound like a particularly challenging situation to mm -hmm. be not only onboarding yourself and other people. And I think that I'm... I'm hoping that people will understand that that is a challenge and that you'll need support and help with it. So I, that's the first thing I'd say. Um, and, ju you know, I think you'll be great. You'll just take one day at a time and, and be methodical about, about what you're doing uh, and have confidence. I think, I think that's my main advice. <laughs> Why I'm doing <laughs> Yeah, no, that, sound, that sounds like a really awesome, <laughs> a really awesome challenge, Shopa. And I think one of the things that I would mention is, um, as I think everything James had said is really right, um, is, and I think there's a question around senior ICs. I think when it comes to sort of the manager of engineers or senior ICs, there's sort of this pressure and this expectation that I need to hit the road running and I need to be producing really early on. But, but don't do that at the cost of not really understanding the why and understanding the support structures. Um, because your team is going to be looking at you for some of the answers and you're going to be experiencing the same things. Um, so it might feel a little bit more amplified for you, um, supporting new people while you yourself are new. But if you're feeling it, chances are they're really feeling it and just sort of really creating the communication paths. But what I would definitely say is ensure you understand the expectations and then ask about what does it mean if those things don't go well? Where do I go? So that's, that's the support mm -hmm. structure. Yeah, but being very upfront about being making that a safe conversation to have around I don't know and I need to know where I'm supposed to go to ask. Great. Sounds good. 
I do have a follow on question. So uh, James, you mentioned creating a new higher uh, Slack channel. I think that's a really good idea because no matter how much we stress as you know, no question is a silly question. Mm. People want to build certain perceptions. People think that, uh, you know, the early perceptions are difficult to erase and then people really shy away from asking those questions. So I think that new channel is a good idea, but like whom do you have on those channels? Because as a manager, yeah. there won't be enough bandwidth to support those questions in a timely so, manner. And sometimes even there'll be lack of knowledge. Yes, yeah, so it's interesting. So what I did, I added everyone who started with us since we went remote. And it's incredible how much people can learn from each other when they're working across different teams and they're all, all onboarding and they're all in that beginner's mind place. And because we've got a mix of more senior people and more junior people in this channel, mm -hmm. uh, I've noticed people have been able to help each other out and I've been um, also observing and answering questions as well. Um, I think it's worth trying, you know, the people have the team they can go to as well, the team channels, but I just thought that dynamic of having a cross team new people mm -hmm place was was important as well mm -hmm. and also as people are going through onboarding at different stages you know someone who's ahead of someone else um can help out someone who's you know not they don't have to reinvent the wheel and things because things are changing fast that new person that joined two months ago might actually have a bit more insight than someone who started a year ago uh, when things were very different uh, so that's that's how i've approached it thank you Wonderful. Thank you so much, Shilpa. Um, next up, we have Mew. Mew, could you jump in and share your challenge and question? Yes. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my question is, what would your advice around build a uh, you know cross-functional or you know, a personal relationship with with your new um, peers, essentially, um, mm -hmm. looking from a, maybe a manager's perspective or a senior IC perspective? Uh, a lot of onboarding. Uh, folks need to have a relationship built across function and not just with your team. Um, I want to kind of hear your advice on how to help uh, that to uh, get accomplished. Thank you. Maybe I can start, James, and then certainly have you um, add to how you've how you've um, attempted this. Again, for me, it's a lot in the preparation. It's in how you're thinking about who's going to be most important for this individual to be able to get to know. Um, are they aware that, that this individual is coming on board, that the manager is coming on board? And I often feel that sometimes with more senior people, we just assume that it's a little bit more intuitive for them to just sort of, you know, knock on the virtual door and get to know who their cross-functional um, partners would be. But I think as the, as the person that is organizing and planning for it, you actually have to really set the expectation with the cross-functional collaborators that this individual will have to get to know and be able to be productive with and make sure that they are understanding your expectations that are also brought into the process. Because I mean, I've been in situations where I'm clear who I need to talk to, but they are suggesting that I have my first one on one of them in three weeks. That's not going to help my success in terms of my onboarding. Um, but then also realizing that perhaps they might not necessarily be the only person. So who else within their group? So sort of having a bit of an, an organogram, but really sort of identifying the who I need to talk to and what, what, what we assume that they'll be able to answer for me, that helps me with my ramp. Um, and then for anybody that is tied to my sort of my, my first success, for a more senior person, they might sort of be like, what do we expect in your first 30, 60, 90 days? So maybe limiting it to the people who are, are most important for the first set of success metrics as opposed to overwhelming with just absolutely everybody. So I think it's really being clear about who is most important um, and then ensuring that they're brought into the process as much as um, you're expecting the new manager to be able to, to navigate and be able to find them and be productive. Mm -hmm. James, is there anything you'd add? Yeah, I, I, I love that, you know, you mentioned about the diagram. I'm very much, I, I guess I'm still a bit of a geek when it comes to how I manage and I, I'm very much into creating diagrams to show relationships between different stakeholders and parts of the members of the team and what they do and um, you know what they own. So I think anything to visualize and simplify things where you don't have those visual cues as you know we talked about that at the beginning in the office, you have, you know, I have, I still, having been in the office, I was only, I only joined Coursera six months ago, but I was there three months, six, sorry, six, 
months ago. I was there three months. And I still think of people in terms of where they sat or, you know, I, I, I got that visual picture of the office. And I think for someone new, if you imagine how difficult that is, if you know, all you've got is a list of people or a list of names in Slack, helping, you know, I, as a manager, I think there's a big responsibility to, to work out uh, who the stakeholders are and help the new person by explaining that to them and and also setting things up with them. So I've got a new team member who's working on search engine optimization and we have a team of people in marketing who are specialists in search engine optimization and I've set time up for this new person to connect with someone and build a relationship and uh, and then I set you know some expectations around that and check back in because these are the kind of things that they maybe take a bit of prompting as well you know how, how did it go have you talked you know have you talked with this person and um you know just kind of nudging again encouraging someone to to go a bit outside their direct sphere sphere into other other areas is really important and especially for managers who are, who are joining mm -hmm. thank you very much <laughs> thanks Pete. thank you mew and thank you to all of our participants, uh, live participants, for jumping in and sharing your challenges and helping us learn from, from you and, and your experience as well. Um, we're going to be transitioning to a more general Q&A. So if you have questions, uh, continue submitting them in the Q&A. Um, since we were on the topic about senior IC, like senior ICs and, and management and onboarding managers, um, Wambui and James, I was wondering if you, could, if you had any maybe distinctions to share for onboarding very senior ICs. This is a question that has come from from Ilya, and so if you have any stink, distinctions to expand on for like the context of a senior IC, we would definitely love to hear those. James, did you want to tackle it first? I, I can go <laughs> first. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know if I think about the attitude before everyone was forced to go remote, the thinking was more senior people have built more confidence up they are more likely to be able to succeed when they're remote. And I do think that's that's the case. You know, I think for senior people, um, they already have that foundational knowledge about what how to work, how what what the expectations are. And I think there's less hand holding needed for uh, senior people. I think for more junior people, um, you know, is the question more around the difference between the two or is it about how do you onboard senior? I kind of missed that. I was going to talk about about the differences, I guess. Yeah, I'll keep going. tips on onboarding very senior ICs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very senior. Yeah. So I, th I think that, you know, the, the thing I mentioned early around setting very clear expectations around ownership and different milestones and making sure that people are being given, you know, more more responsibility faster i think those are those are really key because when you're bringing in senior people you want those senior there's those senior people are going to want to roll their sleeves up and um you know get on with more more challenging work and make make an impact fast and i think that it's key that they're giving that opportunity and the rest of the team encourage that as well so you know there has to be pacing around that but i think that setting the expectation around um projects and responsibility early is, is important so that the, the, so that people can gain that confidence in the new new environment and and really step up yeah and i think the only thing i'd add is oftentimes at senior i see sort of the throwing over the wall of the documentation but actually end up slowing them down so it's how do you actually create the more interactive sessions that mm. allow for them to be able to sort of you know to shoot some ideas and to ask more questions about have you considered and have you done and to get clarity on what the expectations are because certainly there'll be more of a, a push for them to be productive earlier. Um, and then the one thing that I always say is because oftentimes people think people think that those with the experience are more apt to being more sort of proactive about seeking the help or seeking the assistance or seeking the support. Don't forget to still give your senior ICs a buddy because <laughs> um, that's still always really important in terms of how they're able to ask the questions that might not necessarily um, that, that might get stalled if they're having to come to you and maybe like you're the VP of engineering and you're already quite busy. So don't forget to give them the buddy. 
but then maybe make some of that onboarding a lot more live um, so that you are able to, to, to get to the core of what the expectations are um, um, sooner. Yeah, yeah, I just add to that because it made me think of something as well, Mambu. I, you know, I've, I've got a new senior team member joined and yeah, I think what can sometimes happen is that person is the senior person on the team they join and it's important that they have a mentor who's more senior from somewhere on the, in the organization, I think, because they better understand some of the things that they'll, they'll be tackling than maybe someone on the team does. So I think that, you know, being intentional about, you know, okay, we've got a new staff engineer who's a senior staff engineer, who, who's, a, who's someone else around that can really help show them the ropes. Wonderful. I just love the image of throwing somebody over the wall of <laughs> documentation. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, so s since you both mentioned the, the importance of giving them a buddy and helping provide them support, I was wondering if you could, exp this comes from Karen. Karen mm -hmm. submitted this question ahead of time and she wanted to know like what would be the best way to set up that sort of mentoring buddy shadowing relationship uh, ahead of time in, in a remote environment when you're onboarding somebody new. I wonder if you could expand on, on that. Well, I think ahead of someone joining, there's there are ways to connect. I think that that's what I've been practicing a lot is setting an expectation that the mentor and the buddy is reaching out prior to day one and they are able to help them as well as the manager. And and. You know, I think being really intentional about that. I've got someone joining in August, and even now we're we're having calls with a person, and you know, not just leaving everything to HR, as I said earlier, making sure that you're being super organised and intentional with who's the who's a good fit, who's who's a good person to help this this person in terms of their skill set, and um, you know, I, th I think, and also I think when it comes to mentorship, having some form of lightweight. Uh, agreement between the mentor and the mentee is, is key. This probably goes beyond beyond onboarding because we usually think about more of an onboarding buddy than, than a mentor, but I think getting off on the right footing, making sure that you've got ground rules around, you know, building safety into the mentorship relationship and confidential, confidentiality and being honest and direct with each other. You know, I think we haven't really talked a lot about that, but building that trust so that people can give feedback directly in a way that allows the person to take that on board and improve i think is is really key as well so um i've mixed up a few things there but i think the main, main message is start early with the mentorship and be consistent and and i do want us to sort of maybe think about sort of honestly not everybody's meant to be mm. a buddy or a mentor <laughs> so i think it's also just being really clear about sort of what the expectations are and allow the individual who's meant to be the buddy um, to opt out, um, e even if even if you are limited for resource, because that can really impede the onboarding experience. If you sort of have someone that's sort of very resistant to having to answer a lot of questions, um, but then also to be more proactive around sort of the things James spoke about in terms of creating the safety and creating. And so I always find people who are more newly onboarded still feel <laughs> they, they've experienced it and sort of can appreciate what that, what good looks like and, and are more willing, but, but allow people to opt out if that's not sort of their personality. I, I hope that everybody walking away is really getting the sense of how important and powerful expectations are throughout this whole process and how big of an input it is for setting your onboarding up for success. I think that's one of my biggest takeaways just with everything that you both have shared so far. Um, so I think that's, that's incredible. Uh, so wanted to transition a little bit. So Mikhail asked a question about what are your tips for bringing on a large cohort of say 20 plus people that then overtax management and the infrastructure of the process, especially if maybe you have like limited admin support. And so I was wondering if you both could share if you had any tips for onboarding a large cohort at, at a, a big scale very quickly. That's a great question. And so that sort of describes a lot of my life <laughs> in terms of making sure that we sort of have like large teams deployed to some of our partners. Um, Mikhail, it's a great question. And I think what I would say is do it at the pace of the team that it has to bring on the, the, um, the new members of the team. Um, because if they're overly taxed, it's really going to impede on the experience of the people that are coming on board. 
the way we often try to look at it in terms of how one might phase um, onboarding for the teams is what are the teams that are most critical to maybe your product roadmap? What are the squads that need to sort of get scaled up or um, better set up to, 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 to deliver soonest, right? And, and think about it in that way. Or what are the teams where perhaps there's some, some niche roles and it's okay for them to sort of be deployed, even as you're thinking about the larger team. So, I mean, like we've had some partners, we call them partners or customers, um, who it's like, it's, it's a large QA team, but it's against different products. And then we'll structure the onboarding so that there's clarity around what expectations are for the QA team, even as um, they, they then are later deployed into their respective teams. So sort of do the things that are common first for the larger team and then deploy them to the teams that are ready for them. I think there's different ways of thinking about it in terms of what's most critical in terms of your ability to bring on these teams and be productive. Um, and then also maybe how might you sort of create some common onboarding before you deploy them to a team that is, um, that is quite limited for, for resource. Hopefully that's, that's um, useful. James, anything mm -hmm. else that you'd add? I think you covered lots of it there. Um, I think I think the thing that comes to mind is something has to give. You know, if if you're doing an exercise where you're onboarding a lot of people at once, then it's important that something slows down at the same time because you just can't do everything at once. So, I think uh, it just uh, that that speaks to. I think it's similar to what what Wambui said. But yeah, thank you. Awesome. Um, another question coming from Aditya. And apart from, say, happy hours or co-working hours, what do you all do to intentionally facilitate the more freeform or water cooler conversations? Well, I think, I think having activities is, is important that are interactive. You know, I, one, of the, one of the things that I've enjoyed doing is coming up, trying to come up with things that allow people to have um, a bit of fun doing something that where everyone's contributing. And that's where free form conversations come from. So for example, uh, you know, we, we did a cooking experience where everyone prepared some food together and on a Friday, and, and it was just a really fun uh, experience to have every, it was someone someone telling everyone how they're how they're doing it how, how to prepare the food and and then everyone to kind of join in on, on zoom at the same time and I think when people let their guard down doing those kind of activities it leads to other conversation and connections with people um, and I, th I think slack is a great way to, to do this as well you know it, it, that people will communicate in different ways virtually and making sure that you've got areas and channels which are you know we've, we've got one where people share their working space they share pictures of it um and it's and then we've got one with, with called step challenge where people are um sharing activities that they've done to keep fit and i think especially at the moment you want to have those interactions around um you know health health and other part, aspects of people's life and encourage each other to take part in things out, outside work as well and then you know other connections and interests generate from that and so I, i'd say use whichever you know chat tool that you you have to do that um, and there's just try be creative about having new activities that are possible to do virtually i think the only thing i'd add is virtually yeah. and asynchronously <laughs> i think when you have distributed teams and you've got time zones not everyone can join the happy hour. The happy hour is at my breakfast and it's your, <laughs> your evening. So how do you create sort of the ability to, um, to be able to have those shared moments? Um, the one thing we don't use enough of is video. And we've had some really awesome sort of team bonding things where it's like just sort of like me at 8 a.m. And so maybe it's like with the funky hair and, you know, <laughs> and it's just like everyone sort of has like their getting ready in the morning thing. And so what are some of the rituals that you have? What are the foods you're eating? So just sort of trying to get creative about also how to do it asynchronously. Um, and then there are tools, like I think there's like the donut um, bot on Slack that sort of, sort of randomly matches people or creating themed things. But it does require that investment of sort of thinking about how you create it because not everyone's naturally thinking about it when it's a lot more, we're a lot more used to the water cooler conversation. 
um, in a way that creating it might require you as managers to, to start it off. And then they'll start. But we have like cats of Andala. I mean, sort of people will sort of create their affinity or interest groups um, that allow them to connect outside of the work. And that's really, really important. Yeah. I just add one other thing I thought of there. And that was, it's quite easy to just jump into meetings. And if you set five or 10 minutes aside at the beginning of the meeting to have a more freeform discussion or talk about, um, you know, have, have some question that everyone answers, uh, to kind of break icebreakers, those can be really good to um, to help help with that, and or even at the end of meetings, because the thing I've, I noticed was just how much of that connection building happens at the end of a meeting where everyone's kind of walking out or coming into a meeting. And, oh yeah, I, you know I haven't met. My name's James. I think that try to build them into the existing ceremonies or, or sessions that you have can be really really cool. That's a good idea. My most fun was we did an escape room over Zoom, mm -hmm. the best. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Now I'm curious to know if the Cats of Vandela page is public, like if you have a, an Instagram or a, a TikTok or something that we can keep up with. I feel like it should be. I'm going to have to take that, <laughs> that as a possible action. <laughs> okay, we'll include that as a follow-up item. Fantastic. <laughs> um, one a couple quick questions and then we'll be wrapping up in a moment. Um, so along the lines of like some of the more tactical things you can introduce for some of the more informal things, some of the challenges that the community has shared are sharing some of the more informal cultural based, um, like how we get things done as an organization context. And so I was wondering, so you both have shared like the types of conversations that should happen, like when you set expectations and the types of things you should communicate about how to get these things done. I was wondering if you had any other ideas about how to pass along some of that context-based, more informal culture knowledge about how the org gets things done. If you had any other tactics about how to pass along that information. So we certainly had the benefit of a lot of video. So just even like, how do we celebrate? Like that, that's sort of like a, how do you all get pumped up and celebrate and create those moments? Um, it's hard to start to do it when you're all remote other than, you know, taking a recording <laughs> of a Zoom call where everybody sort of, you know, gets to celebrate with their arms up and stuff. But, um, but, but I think it's maybe finding who the culture carriers are and sort of inviting people to sort of meetings where they can talk about how things used to be or sort of what's exciting about I don't know if there's a lot exciting these days, but, <laughs> but sort of what's exciting about um, the culture and how the organization has evolved to uh, sort of the new normal. Um, but again, that's another one where I feel like we have to be thinking about it proactively. And oftentimes, I think for many companies, we're waiting till we can go back, right? And so this, there isn't a lot of investment in how you translate that for sort of new people coming on board um, during this time. So sort of investing in this not being the interim and creating those um, ways of engaging um, in a way that's a little bit more accessible today. Mm. Yeah, I think I'd add to that. Um, you know, in, in, the, in the case of Coursera, we have learners all around the world and we have, and there are lots of stories that learners bring. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we try to do is in the same way as um, other companies would reach out to customers, have people, have guests come to come to talk to everyone at all hands, um, bring your customer, um, hear from, hear their experience, hear their pain, and bring that, you know, get, ultimately bring, build that bridge between what people are doing day to day and the value that you're you're bringing i think that that's really key um also i think that one of the things that we've made sure that we maintain is our makeathon so it's similar to a hackathon we call it a makeathon it's something that everyone at the company gets involved with at coursera and um we have other activities we in the in the summer we're doing an activity as well which is uh, a summer camp where we've got things organized as well so you know, I, th I think those are the opportunities to actually share more of the culture and the connections to what why we're here, right? I think that that's that's kind of key. That the 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 real purpose and uh, behind why we're why we're coming to work every day and building things is is really really key to everyone feeling empowered and um, motivated. 
Thank you, James. Thank you, Mbui. So Jason is dying to know how the heck you do an escape room over Zoom. Um, and so you can feel free to answer that. But the the other question I'd, I'd like to, to ask you both, you know, it, it is so clear that you two just deeply enjoy digging into how do you meaningfully and effectively bring people into work and make that experience joyful and, and welcoming and fun. Um, so really, we'd love to also know, how did, how did you, the story of how you two first started to work together and to get to know each other and, and you know, how did, how did you two come together to, to make these really important things happen? Um, so tell us the, back, the background of that. And if you know how to do a virtual escape room, Jason's dying to know. <laughs> well, you know, since, since joining Coursera, we've been w working with a few folks from Andela. I have people on my team and, you know, a mix of people from Andela, but also full-time employees. And, and through that, I've met Wambu, I've met Wambu's team. Um, I really am impressed with the way that I've worked with a number of different organizations, um, but I really love the way that Wambu uh, and her team think about onboarding, think, think about preparing um, people from Andela for success. And I've learned a lot through uh, some of the things that, I, that Wambu has shared with me. So, um, so, you know, we've met through that and also um, we were both invited to do a previous talk together and, and we've um, been, you know, we've, we've done this once before where we, we got together on a call and spent mm -hmm. quite a few sessions uh, figuring out how we can best communicate some of the challenges that we've come across um, and how we've mitigated them. So, yeah. Wampui, what do you have to add? Sure. And um, so sort of Andela's business model is essentially um, in finding talent where you may not always look for talent. Um, and we just do a really good job of finding really awesome people who will generally be remote and distributed. Most of them are in six countries in Africa, though we are expanding to all of Africa um, in order to double our talent pool and into other markets as well. And so how you onboard is really critical to the success of our engagement. And our engineers are essentially deployed as embedded team members. So the expectation is they will, they'll be with you for over a year. And so it's less about just onboarding to get a particular project fulfilled. It's really how do we become part and parcel of James's success? How does our team um, ensure that they are as much a part of the team? And before, when, we, when there was travel, we would send our team and some of our team members have been able to go and work with James's team. Um, but now we're really learning how do we have to learn in order to be able to help James in thinking about how that forming, norming and storming can happen in a remote way for his entire team, because our team is his team. Um, and it's just been so awesome to work with James because like you've heard today, he has such great intention and such motivation around making sure the team is successful. So his team is well taken care of in terms of the Andela engineers, because they know that they're, that, 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 that they're being set up for success. So yeah, so it's been an awesome experience working with James. Absolutely. Well, I, I'm sitting here as, as somebody who's like, man, I, uh, you know, Jerry, tune, tune out, but I'm like, man, I wish th these two were, were my, my managers. Um, just because both of you, like the intention is so clear of, of mm -hmm. the type of experience you want to create for people and how you want people to enjoy and feel connected and feel impactful and to feel like they belong. And so it, it really, it really stands out as you two talk about onboarding. And um, I know we're, we're getting close to, to our time here. So we're going to do one last thing to, to wrap up. I mean, we've, we've been everywhere. We've talked about how to be somebody's champion, setting week one objectives, the importance of expectations in all aspects of onboarding, how to welcome people as culture adds, not just culture fits, and how to measure or the efficacy of your integration by the amount of communication that happens and so many more really great insights from Wombui and James. Um, one of the most effective ways to learn and to take action and not just to have this live in your brain, but also to apply it in your organization is by learning from the people who are also experiencing the same challenges as you, your peers. So everybody else who is joining on this call, peers give the opportunity to extract the lessons and to see them applied in all these different contexts. So you get to multiply your reps and increase your effectiveness faster. So we're going to harness the power of peers. So in the chat, you'll have noticed I have posted a Google doc and I invite you to share one small specific action that you would like to take in your onboarding to improve your onboarding. And what will happen is you will see a ton of different people share their ideas and it will continue to ignite new ideas in your brain of what else you could do. So you don't just get 
your inspiration and what you took away, but you get everybody else's takeaways that you can then also apply. So take a few minutes, uh, a few seconds to share your, the one action you're going to take to improve your onboarding. Um, and so I would, for the live participants on the call, I know we did not talk about this, so this is a surprise, but I would love for you to jump in and share if there's one takeaway that you've had that you would love to apply to your onboarding to, to share it. And so Mew, Shilpa, or Chris, if one of you would like to jump in and let us know the action you're going to take. Shilpa, jump on. Sure. I think uh, culture ad is, is the thing that I'm going to remember and not, I'll remember it as someone who is going through onboarding myself as well as, you know, make that part of the team culture. Um, you know, every single team member needs to have this culture and mindset. So that, that, that's one thing. And I think that alone will, will drive many other concrete actions. Awesome. Thank you so I much, Shopa. Uh, I, I, I think I'll probably take a, a, a hard look at um, how people are communicating and what types of uh, questions they're asking and, and, and that kind of stuff as more of a definitive measurement of uh, um, you know how far along and are they in the onboarding process as opposed to you know the first commit the first code review the first mm -hmm. you know so on and so forth those are great benchmarks but I think that the, the type of communication that they're having you know and the content of is probably um, king for that wonderful awesome. you yeah, I really enjoyed the uh, visualization of the organization and also um, stakeholders and, and the working relationship between folks and teams. Uh, I, think, I think that's that's one action I, I, I would like to follow up to and to actually do. Great. Thank you. And we have a bunch of people jumping on the Google Doc. Ilya, Mikhail, Thomas, and Jason have all started to share a, a number of really awesome actions, encouraging fun, um, Slack channel for new folks, we have people ensuring that senior team members have a buddy. Uh, so tons of great actions are being being shared there. Um, Wambui, James, before we, we close, do you have any any final last last thoughts or words of encouragement you'd like to share for everybody on the call? Um, I just say going beyond engineers to new managers is really important, right? You know, I, I was thinking about Shilpa and her story, and you know, it really spoke to me when you said thinking about that for yourself for culture ad um, I'm so passionate about representation in engineering and I think that as a new manager it can also be a, a, a very very challenging place when people are new I've been there right where and I think that it's important if you're a manager of managers to set up your managers to, for success as well as think just thinking about engineers and make sure that you've got a really great um, you know set of expectations for different managers on, on that on that journey as well on that path. So I think that was just something that came to mind at the end when we just to add that context, because I know we've got a lot of leaders in this in this group. That's what we're about. Um, what should I add? I think it's I mean, this might be like a lot. And I know you're all already very, very busy people <laughs> trying to do a lot of things in a short amount of time. Um, but that investment up front in setting the expectations and being really clear before onboarding starts and just getting organized before onboarding starts really sets you and the individuals that are getting onboarded up for success in a way that trying to do it on the fly might end up being distracted or disrupted. So just really investing on that time ultimately helps you in the long run. Wonderful. Well, Bui, James, thank you both so much once again. And for everybody who, who joined us and, and you gave your time today, thank you all for, for joining and thank you for sharing your insights and, and your time with us. So until next time, everybody, enjoy the rest of your day or evening from wherever you're dialing in from, and we will see you next time.